Good morning, Duck Church. It is so good to be able to gather together this morning in our homes to worship our Lord and Savior on this special Sunday, Palm Sunday, as we worship together our Lord Jesus. I invite you to participate as much as you possibly can this morning, that you might enter into a spirit of worship and praise as together we worship Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, and our friend. Friends, let us confess our sin to God, trusting that God's steadfast love endures forever. Let us pray together. God of heaven and earth, we give thanks for sending us Jesus Christ in your name. Even though we profess to follow him, we confess that in times of trial, we too often deny him. Forgive us and heal us, we pray. Help us to put our faith not in the princes of this world, but only in the Prince of Peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is the Lord who helps us. Who will declare us guilty? Because of the grace we received in baptism, we have nothing to fear. Forgiven and freed, we share the peace of Christ with one another this morning. May the peace of Christ be with you. And this morning, let us lift our voices in song as we sing together. Join with us at home, will you?
today, we have a special message for our children. God's Story, Palm Sunday. So part of God's story happened on a day we call Palm Sunday, and it begins like this. Remember how God sent his son Jesus to rescue us? Well, not everybody believed that Jesus was really God's son and the rescuer, but the ones who did believe in him did something pretty cool on Palm Sunday. It started just like any other day for Jesus. He was heading into Jerusalem with his disciples, but before they got there, Jesus did something surprising. He stopped and sent two of his disciples to get a young donkey from a nearby village. He even told them exactly where the owner had last tied it up. They weren't sure why he needed the donkey, but they obeyed him. Kids, would you be willing to obey Jesus even if he asked you to do something you didn't understand? Anyway, when the disciples got back with the donkey, they threw their coats on its back like a saddle, and Jesus climbed up. Pretty soon the disciples saw why Jesus needed it. See, crowds of people came to the road and started laying coats and tree branches to make a path for Jesus. When this happened, many people recognized that Jesus was a king. Only kings came into a city like this. So Jesus rode the donkey like he was a one-man parade. And the crowds praised Jesus by yelling things like, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, and peace in heaven and glory in the highest, because they believed Jesus was the rescuer. But remember how some people didn't believe Jesus was God's son? Well, they told Jesus to make everybody stop yelling. They didn't think Jesus deserved to be treated like a king. You know what Jesus said? He told them, if they keep quiet, the rocks will cry out. Well, the people who didn't believe in Jesus didn't like thinking about people or rocks praising him. And that made Jesus sad. He actually started crying. And not just crying, weeping. Here, the people were standing next to the rescuer they've been wanting and waiting for their whole lives, and they were missing it. But even though Jesus cried, Palm Sunday isn't a sad story. Easter is all about Jesus' amazing rescue, and Palm Sunday is a reminder of just how special that rescue is, and how much Jesus loves everyone. And that's the story of Palm Sunday. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. Jesus was traveling. He sent his disciples to get a donkey. People spread coats and branches on the road. They praised Jesus. Some people didn't recognize that he was king. That made Jesus sad. He had come to rescue them. A few days later, he would show just how much he loves us. And that's a part of God's story. And this morning, let us join our hearts and minds together as we go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we enter this Holy Week, strengthen us to move beyond the festive parade of palms and to follow Jesus into the way of the cross, that united with him and all the faithful, we may one day enter through the gates of righteousness into the eternal city, the new Jerusalem, where we may praise you with Christ, and the Holy Spirit forever. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
So today we begin with a video clip of Palm Sunday. There is immediacy to the scene. It quickly calls to mind the familiar, perhaps too familiar text. Savor the faces in the first scene, the departure from Caesarea Philippi to Jerusalem after the moment we recalled in our scripture passage for today. Those chilling words about taking up the cross and following Jesus. Watch for Peter's face. Notice the youngest man in the group, surely John, the beloved disciple. Do not look for Jesus to be a Hollywood blonde type. This man from the Mediterranean world will haunt you with his intense dark eyes. Above all, catch the mixed mood of the day. The three C's of Palm Sunday, crowd, celebration, and confusion. The confusion swirls around expectations to be met, questions to be answered, and fears to be relieved. Could you picture yourself in the crowd during the film clip? I hope so. Later in this week, we'll sing, were you there when they crucified my Lord, when they nailed him to the tree, when they laid him in the tomb, when he rose up from the dead? Back up a few days and ask yourself, were you there when they waved palms in praise? We all know the right answer to that question. There's a call to confession that goes like this. Judas, slave of jealousy, where are you? I am here. Peter, slave of fear, where are you? I am here. Thomas, slave of doubt, where are you? I am here. Men and women of Jerusalem, enslaved to mob rule, where are you? I am here. Pilate, slave of expedience, where are you? I am here. The story of Christ's passion and death mirrors for us much of our weakness and sin. We all come here as men and women and boys and girls who have missed the mark and who are alienated from God and our neighbor near and far. We identify with those in the crowd who will praise Jesus on Sunday and deny, betray, or abandon him a few days later. However, we can possibly see ourselves in that crowd in a more favorable light. Did you ever wonder who was the first to say Hosanna? Would we have had the faith, the insight, and the courage to cry out first? Did the first Hosanna come by the same sort of prearrangement that Jesus made to secure the donkey in the upper room? Or did someone see Jesus on the donkey and pull together all the nonverbal clues, get the point, and cry out, Hosanna? I don't know, but I do know they said, Hosanna, save now. And that cry led to more confusion. Saved now from what? From sin and death or from Roman tyranny? Saved now from religious hungers or abject poverty? Jesus surely had a mixture of feelings on that first Palm Sunday, a combination of joy over the affirmation and tears over the misunderstanding and the adulation and over the city he loved. Luke says that he wept at the sight of the city. There's more here than the fine dramatic contrast between the enthusiastic and shouting crowd and Jesus in the midst of the tumult weeping. There's more than the irony of one crying while the many are celebrating. Jesus wept because he could see what the city was and what the city could be. He still weeps for all cities, all nations, all churches, and all persons who are less than he would have us to be. A fresh interpretation suggests that he wept possibly because of the temptation of the moment. This triumphal entry, as we call it, looked like a zealot rally, a coronation of a king, even though Luke went to some pains to make it clear that Jesus' reign was peaceful. Was Jesus tempted? to turn the movement into a revolutionary movement? 
Was he tempted to go the way of the power of this world? Was he tempted to ride a zealot wave of revolution? Remember Luke 4, the temptations? Remember the vision of the kingdoms of the world from the crest of Mount Olives? Jesus had Asia at his back and the Mediterranean world of Europe ahead of him. Remember the temptation at the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. From the crest of the Mount of Olives, the pinnacle of the temple was directly in front of Jesus. If the temptation loomed up, he gave the same response he had given in the wilderness, a resounding no. He was coming as the king of peace on earth, goodwill among all people. The prophecy of Luke 2, the song of the angels to the shepherds had come true. His tears were over a city which did not understand the kind of king, the kind of peace it needed. His tears were for a city that did not understand how he fleshed out heaven's peace on earth in the way he lived, the way he talked, and the way that he would die. Jesus weeps not over his own fate, but over the fate of the city. We see this here and in two other passages in Luke. In Luke 13, verses 34 and 35, we read, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And then from Luke 23, 26 through 32. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For surely the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? And then there's the view at Duck United Methodist. All of Holy Week would echo the mixture of understanding and misunderstanding of day one, Palm Sunday. The followers of Jesus getting the point sometime and on other occasions tragically misunderstanding their master. We get to follow Jesus during Holy Week and try to understand all that happens to him and to us. We follow Jesus as we read our Bibles and pray. We follow him on Thursday evening as we observe a very special observance of the love feast together. We get to follow Jesus and hear his signals on Friday. I hope many will tune in for Good Friday night when we explore how Jesus entered into the darkness of that darkest of days. Then comes Easter morning, next Sunday, as we celebrate as a joyful people. My prayer is that we will experience the meaning of this week as fully as possible. You know, it's a shame to come together and worship on Palm Sunday, to sing Hosanna, loud Hosanna, and then not Come back until Easter to sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. It's going from mountain peak to mountain peak and not going with Jesus into the valley, into the garden, and on to the foot of the cross. Someone compared the Palm Sunday to Easter skip to a high school student opening an admissions letter from his or her first college choice and then skipping to graduation day. She would miss all the tests, term papers, and all the all-nighters, but she would also miss the friendships, the mentoring professors, the lifelong network of relationships, the maturing, the excitement, and the growth of college. 
Holy Week offers life's greatest growth and maturation experience for those who relive it as fully as possible with our Lord. Someone may say, you're asking us to do a lot this week. Well, let me just say this. Where else do you have to go? When I consider what Jesus did for us these days, I believe there should be no apologies for the richness of the church's schedule. Only apologies for those who neglect it. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. The great gifts of these days are there for us. I pray that we will receive them in their richness and in the fullness of their meaning. Meanwhile, back in the crowd, because I can't get the crowd off my mind, and to it let us return. Matthew 21 records that people ask, who is this? And receive the answer, this is the prophet Jesus. Now the common people surely would have welcomed a prophet, a voice from the common people, fearlessly naming injustice, calling the rich and the powerful to account on the basis of God's holy law. But who really wants prophets with their shoulds, oughts, and musts? What rings with prophetic courage when addressed to others quickly turns to scolding moralism and a burden of guilt heaped on us when preached to us? In Romans 7, Paul complained about the gap between what he ought to do and his ability to actually do it. If he can't pull it off, what of us? The good news is that Jesus is more than a prophet. He is the Word made flesh, God incarnate. And that is why we cheer on Palm Sunday if we understand what the stakes are. We don't need another prophet berating us. We need the presence and power of God, a direct connection to empower us for all of life's necessary shoulds, oughts, and musts. We need the direct, immediate presence of God, not petty sacrifices purchased with exact, exact change in the right currency from the tables of the money changers. And maybe, just maybe, on that first Palm Sunday, there were some people who got it right, singing Hosanna in the highest, because they were in the presence of someone who opens up the way to God like no one before or since, someone who so perfectly and completely made God present that they knew with Jesus they could find the holiness and power for life they ate for but lacked on their own. Was Jesus crucified for being a prophet who overturned the tables of commerce? Yes. But that's only part of the reason for the crucifixion. What made everyone fear him enough to kill him was the immediacy of his presence, this direct sense of the power of God accessible to us and making us accessible to God. Scary stuff for sinners. This story helps make the point. Some students were into a Bible study on the baptism of Jesus. Their leader said, when Jesus was baptized, the heavens were opened. The Greek word for open is the same word from which we get schizophrenic. It means the heavens were split, ripped open, a violent image. What separates us from, from God is now open. We can get to God. In Jesus, we can reach up to God and be close to God. But one young man said, no, that's not what it means. It means that when Jesus was baptized, the heavens were ripped, so now it means that God can get to us anytime God wants. Now nobody's safe. The presence and power of God is let loose in Jesus Christ. The presence and power of God from us to him and from him to us is let loose in Jesus Christ. The presence and power of God is let loose on earth as it is in heaven in Jesus Christ. No wonder some worship and others crucify him. This week is all about the presence and power, day by day, step by step. Today we join with many Christian brothers and sisters around the world in waving palms at the end of the service. I'd encourage you to go out into, out into your yard and find a branch of something 
and bring it in to wave it during this time in the service. The disciples used palms in their day because that was what was readily available. This doesn't look much like a palm, but it's readily available in my yard. And so I encourage you to get your branches out. By accepting the palms, we say with deeds beyond words, I identify with those disciples who long ago welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem. I welcome him into my life and into my town. I welcome the presence and power of God into my life. But this prophetic gesture is itself in danger of being misunderstood. After all, as preachers and teachers have observed ever since the first Palm Sunday, in all likelihood, some of those in the crowd who cried Hosanna on Sunday were part of the mob shouting, crucify him on Friday. Palm Sunday, as we observe it, is a combination of different gospel accounts, rather like our Christmas nativity pageant with Matthew's wise men arrive just as Luke's shepherds are leaving. And in regards to Palm Sunday, of the four gospels, only John mentions palms. In waving the palms, we are in danger of being misunderstood, and not just over which gospel is our source. The issue is not textual, but ethical. The disciples got it right on Palm Sunday, but before Passion Week was over, one had betrayed him, one had denied him, three had fallen asleep instead of keeping watch, one had forgotten about peace and reached for his sword, and all but one had run away. Because of what happened after Palm Sunday, the day is both a time of celebration of Jesus as a peaceful king and a painful reminder of coming failure. Some of you are appropriately uncomfortable with Palm Sunday because you take very seriously what is coming. So wave your palm as one on the edge of the crowd wondering if Jesus really can be more than a prophet, if he really can save now. Accept it as one who will try to go with him through the garden, go with him through the judgment. Accept it as one who longs for grace and glory and prays for the courage to go with him all the way, the courage for facing this hour. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away, They're washed away. Friends. 
strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. This morning, as we offer our gifts to God, we have much to be grateful for. Let us offer to God the thanksgiving and praise in our hearts as we offer to him the labors of our lives. Let us pray. Oh God, we offer these gifts through your church. We give you thanks that we have the opportunity to share with those around the world who are in need. Bless these gifts as we offer them as the fruit of our labors, that you might multiply them and bless them and give us wisdom to use them to extend the reach of the church throughout the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. So now we come to a time for music again, and we want you to sing along at home. So let's join us as we lift up our voices in praising our Lord this morning. It's not my life to live It's not my song to sing All I have is His For all eternity It's not my righteousness not my faithfulness all I have is his for all eternity we will crown him crown him king of glory crown bear but by his 
Let's receive this blessing. Live in peace, trusting in Christ's promise that we will be with him in paradise. And may you know the love of Christ, the mercy of the Father, and the fire of the Spirit as you go with the one God who is Father of us all. Amen.